continue a little bit in the vein of putting on Christ, and we'll see where we'll go from there. I don't expect to be long, but I do say that all the time, so I, wouldn't, I would take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Pentecostal minute, yeah, that's right. Uh, so I want to look at um, a passage that we started with last week, Romans chapter 13, verse number 11, and we're going to read through 14. Amen. When you're there, say amen. Amen. Praise God. Here's what it reads. And do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. Therefore, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off. Somebody shout cast off. Cast off. The works of darkness. And let us put on. Somebody shout put on. Put on. The armor of light. Put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision. Do not provide for the flesh. Don't give it nutrition. We're talking about spiritually, of course. Give your physical flesh nutrition. <laughs> But spiritually, make no provision for the lust, the desires of your flesh to fulfill its lust. Amen. And then also Galatians chapter 3, 27. Galatians 3, verse 27. And I'll read the King James here. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You want to put on Christ? The first step is being baptized into Christ. And if you believe the word of God, I want you to say amen. 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 Baptism is an essential part of coming into the kingdom of God. It's not a rite of passage. It's not something we do to show we're Christians now. Thank God for that. I want to I want to show I'm a Christian. Sure. But it's not just that as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And as the scriptures teach us, only Christ is good enough or eligible to be saved. Only the man Christ Jesus, myself, nor you are eligible or good enough to be saved. It is when we have on Christ that we're able to take advantage of God's salvation. Amen. And the scripture teaches as many as have been baptized into Christ, they have put on Christ. So that's the first base level. Amen. I want to uh, add something to last week. Um, and it's going to be kind of in the vein of labor. Um, tomorrow's Labor Day. And as I was talking to the Lord, I kind of felt something about labor. And so this is part two, put on Christ and, and drop your own labor. Amen. Put on Christ and drop your own or cast off your own labor, however you want to put that. Amen. So with that being said, I want to read up one more passage and then I'll, I want to share a couple things here at the onset. Hebrews chapter four, beginning at verse number nine. Hebrews chapter four, beginning at verse nine. And the King James Version reads, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Amen. Verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, that's referring, of course, to Jesus, 
He that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from, from his own works or his own labors, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Praise God. Scripture heavy today, but I, I uh, discern that that's okay. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. And we're going to pull this all together. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. <clears throat> Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus uh, through Timothy. But be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to to our works. Okay, I want you to see something there. There is the rest of God. There is the works of God. And then there's our works. Those are two different things. Praise God. Uh, he And called us with an holy calling and not according to our works. But according to his own purpose and grace. Which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. This is the work of God. Who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. That's the work of God. And we are called... If we're going to be right with God, and if we're ultimately going to be saved, we are called to enter into the rest that he has won through his works. He has wrought or brought forth the rest through the works he did. So our works, we try sometimes unintentionally, subconsciously, to do a bunch of things and, and hopefully this will open up some rest and we'll be at peace and we'll have this or we'll have that. But the works of man only produces more problems. But the works of God produces rest. And the book says, if you're going to labor to do anything, labor to enter into the rest of God. Uh, I had this, as I was driving here, I had this thought that the Lord impressed upon my mind. And the thought was, God does not work on a brownie point system. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can't get brownie points with God. You, you can't do a whole bunch of impressive things or what we might think is impressive and make God any more impressed with us or love us any more than he already does. It's not possible. It's not the works that we do that produces God's grace in our lives, that produces God's mercy upon us, that, that makes God wants to, to, to wrap his loving arms around us and draw us close. It's not even our works that makes God wants to, want, want to bless us in, in physical ways, physical blessings in this life. It's not even our works that makes him want to do that. He is a, the Bible says, he's a good father. Amen. I don't know about you, but growing up, I had a father that was there. He was in the house and he worked and thank God that he provided for us. But I wouldn't say he was a great father all the way around. 
he was there and then he wasn't there and, you know, and all this stuff. And I'm not saying anything that anybody doesn't know. Me and my father have a good relationship now. But when I was growing up, he wasn't the best father. And, and, and some of you in this room, you can attest to what I'm talking about. Some of you grew up with fathers that weren't that great. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other people grew up with fathers that were great. And that's wonderful. But, but the father that we have in Jesus is not to be compared with earthly fathers. Our heavenly father is in a class of his own. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost trying to talk right now. Our heavenly father is in a class of his own and you don't have to try to earn his favor. Amen. The Bible said he just gives good gifts to them that ask. And then James wrote, you have not because you ask not. It's not a difficult equation. It, and if he thinks it's not a good thing for you, he just won't give it. Or if he thinks it's not the right time, then he will delay. But he's a good father and he will not chastise you or I for asking. Amen. Amen. In fact, it is the will of God that we would ask more and complain less and worry less. Just ask of him. And he's not going to, the Bible said, if you ask of God, he's a good father. Will, will he give you a scorpion if you ask for a fish? No. How much the more will your heavenly father give good gifts to them that ask? Amen. Hallelujah. He's good. And we don't have to, we don't have to try to be on our P's and Q's, if you will. Now, this is not licensed just to live how you want to live and do what you want to do, but we cannot live according to the righteousness and the holiness of God without first having and cultivating a deep relationship with our Father. Because it is by His strength, it's by His grace and by His anointing and by His power that we're going to be able to conduct our lives in a way that pleases him. Amen. And the closer we get to Jesus is the more that we realize we want to please him. Amen. Sometimes we can see some what we, might, what we might refer to as the super Christians among us. And we'll be like, oh, I'll never get there. The only reason they're where they're at. They're, well, that's a tongue twister. The only reason they are where they are at is because they made up in their mind a long time ago, I'm going to pursue Jesus above everything. Right. And in that pursuit, over the course of the time of their pursuit, they began to realize, boy, this walking with Jesus is pretty awesome. It is. Amen. Yeah, this, this, this putting God first thing is pretty profitable. And, and so as a result, they want to continue to put God first. They want to increase even that putting God first. And so then they, they step into a flow with Jesus where they just flat trust him. Because you can hear me today, hear me clearly. You cannot and you will not trust someone you don't know. This is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he said, depart from me, ye workers of what? Iniquity. I never knew you. So, so, so here's the deal. When you, the more you know God, and that know in the original language refers to an intimate relationship and knowledge of the more you know him. That's why the Bible says in the Old Testament, and so-and-so so -so knew his wife. Y'all can read between the lines and know what that means. Okay, this is, That's the same word used there in that passage when Jesus says, I never knew you. We were not in an intimate, connected, deep relationship. And so therefore, because of that, because that was lacking, 
Iniquity was the only other option. And iniquity is me doing my own will above the will of God and not even seeking his will. I, I just I just want the blessings. Bless me, Jesus. Bless me. But I don't want to I don't really want to pursue what God is trying to say and what God has called me to do. I don't want to pursue him like that. I'll leave that up to the pastors and the preachers and the evangelists and then they can feed me every Sunday and to where then I can go home and I can't even feed myself. It's funny, natural babies, a six month old, for instance, imagine if you only fed your six month old once a week. They'd be D E A D. So if I just feed myself once a week spiritually, will I be D E A D? <laughs> and, and the interesting thing ab about being spiritually dead is a lot of times folks don't even know it because God allows strong delusion. The Bible says God sends strong delusion and he don't send it because he's trying to be mean. He allows this strong delusion to come because that's what we've chosen. All right, have it your way. You want to live a Burger King life? Have it your way. Praise oh, God. God. <laughs> that took a second. Y'all were like, what? Oh. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, this is not a Burger King faith. This is not, we, it's got to be his way. Amen. Because his way, whether we believe it or not, is better than your way. In fact, Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah wrote, uh, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. Amen. And so if we're going to labor to do anything on this Labor Day weekend, labor to enter into his rest. Labor to come into the the intimate place with Jesus. The most intimate place of a married couple is their bedroom. And Jesus is inviting you into his bedchamber. Hallelujah. It's open to you. Let's get connected. Let's get intimate. I want to know you. I want you to know me. I want to unveil myself to you. I want to reveal myself to you. And it is in the revealing of himself to us that we realize it clicks. My goodness, this is the best thing ever. We can't know that unless we choose to say, I'm going to believe that little preacher up there and I'm going to finally do that. Because I don't talk to you today without experience in this. I talk to you from an abundance of experience. Stepping into that bedroom chamber. And getting intimate with God. I, I, there, there are times when I pray and seek God. And just fellowship with him and be intimate with him for a couple of hours. And in two hours, I haven't asked him for one thing. You know why? Because I've reached a place uh, that I just want to be with him. I don't need to ask for anything sometimes. I just want to be with him. Because you know what the Bible says? He already knows what we have need of before we ask. And yes, we're supposed to ask. But sometimes he's not trying to hear you ask it stuff all the time. He just wants to be with you. And it is, it, it's in those moments of just being with him that we grow. That we begin to see him in new and fresh and intimate ways. I'm preaching to you today from a place of conviction. God wants to be intimate with you. Hallelujah. And that's the place of true rest. There, this world is full of hustle and bustle. This world is full of heartache and pain. And what the world would tell you is just get more stuff, get more money, get more this. And you, one day when you get enough, you'll realize I've made it and I'm chilling and I'm good. The devil is a liar. 
somebody wrote a hip hop song a long time ago uh, called 99 Problems or something like that. I don't remember anything about it, so I'm just, if it's, anyway. <laughs> or, or no, it's more money, more problems. That's what it was. More money, more problems. And that's true. I, I, I was able to, the Lord was, the Lord blessed me and my family this week with, 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 I, I was able to get a, a new position at a new company. And, and I thank, I, I thank God for that. But here's the deal. While it might pay us more money and we might be able to do some things and my wife is, doesn't have to go and work as many hours anymore and she can stay home with the kids and be their teacher and homeschool them and all that. That's what we wanted. And God came through. Thank God. And there's, there's going to be more money coming in the household. Thank God. That's what everybody wants. But you better be careful. Because with more money, with more money comes more temptations. With more of the things of this world, it's more tempting to engage our flesh and to entertain the carnal nature. It's far more tempting to do that when you got more stuff. Praise God. That's why the Bible says to live modestly. You know, people, people, sometimes people will sort of fight against this idea of modesty. We talk about modesty in living, modesty in dress, modesty in, in you know, spending, all of this modesty stuff. But, you know, God designed the principle of modesty to bless you. Because the scripture says people chase after stuff, after money, after extravagance. And guess what? The Bible says that they are pierced through with many sorrows. Because if we don't know how to handle the stuff, we will destroy ourselves. True. Amen. Amen. So I thank God for the blessing. But more than the blessing, I want the wisdom to handle it properly. Yeah. Praise God. And, and, and wisdom comes from the scriptures. Uh, the apostle Paul told Timothy, he says, and thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Praise God. And, and, and uh, if we're not careful, we can idolize the rich and the famous and, 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 and be looking at someone in a position where we want to be one day. Oh, they've got all the stuff that I think I want. But you don't know how they're living behind closed doors. You don't know the emptiness. You don't know the drama. They're, they're all over the news in 2023. There's been, I've heard stories of many rich people that all of a sudden they, they killed their kids, they killed their wife, and then they blew their own heads off. I thought they had it all. right that's the way it is now if you know how to handle money or just stuff in general then it could be a great blessing i mean look at the story of joseph he was he was made lord over all of the wealth of egypt and because he was wise egypt and the children of israel was able to survive because of all of the grain that he stored up during those seven years of plenty. Because after the seven years of plenty, the Bible says there were seven years of famine. And if they didn't have a wise governor over the land in Joseph, everybody would have been dead. The Bible says, in all you're getting, get understanding. And wisdom is the principal thing. Folks are so wrapped up in getting stuff that they don't get understanding. Amen. So I want to minister that to you today. Enter into the rest of God. Enter into the wisdom of God. Enter into the, the principles of the scriptures of your Savior. 
Hallelujah. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Hallelujah. I want to ascend to the hill of my God with clean hands and a pure heart. And I don't want to lift up my soul unto vain things, the writer said. Hallelujah. Nor do I want to swear deceitfully. I want to be full of the integrity of my God. Amen. The Bible said in Proverbs chapter 3, to, that we ought not forsake mercy nor truth, because in so doing, we will find favor with God and with man. God's principles has a way of not only positioning us to have favor with heaven, but to also have favor in the earth with man. <laughs> God's principles takes care of everything. If we'll just apply it, enter into his rest. Put on Christ. This is what I minister to you today. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Take his yoke upon you. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Preacher, where do I find out his burden and his yoke? Open your Bible. Study the word of God. Call on his name in prayer. Say, Lord, guide me. You don't have to pray a, a 1611 King James Version Bible prayer. You don't have to have that kind of prayer language. Just pray with your normal vernacular. And talk to God with sincerity and say, Lord, I thought I had it all together. I... I, I think that I'm pretty smart, but if you don't know the word of God, y y trust me, none of us are as smart as we think if we don't know the word of God. And I hope that doesn't come off as an insult because it's not meant to be. I'm pretty un, un, unintelligent if I don't know the word of God. I mean, in, I, might be, I might be book smart. I might, I might have some earthly street smarts. I might have some business smarts. But when it comes to saving my soul and when it comes to having peace, hallelujah, peace that surpasses all understanding, when it comes to having joy unspeakable and full of glory, when it comes to the intangibles, we're good at the tangibles, but we cannot acquire the intangible, intangibles without the help of the Spirit of God. And the intangibles matter. You can have all the stuff and the money in the world, but it won't heal your cancer. It won't deliver you from that broken heart. You can have a broken heart and be bitter about something and you can tell yourself, well, I'll just go get a tub of ice cream or I'll just go on a shopping spree with all the money I've accumulated. But once you once you're done with that, guess what? You are even more bitter and you are even more broken hearted because it is God that has put eternity in our hearts and only he can fill that void. Only putting on Christ can give us this great hope. A hope that is transcendent above the rudiments of this world. Hallelujah. Praise God. If you believe it, why don't you give God a hand clap and say, help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is a respecter of faith and obedience. God is a respecter of faith and obedience. He is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't care what your job title is. He doesn't care if you've got a hundred dollars to your name or a hundred million dollars to your name. God does not respect you any more or any less because of what you have or don't have. Amen. Amen. The Bible said in Galatians 6 that there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither rich nor poor. 
there is neither male nor female, and that simply means males are not better than females and females are not better than males. But we are all one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. God loves the man homeless on the street with a dollar to his name just as much as he loves and wants to save you and I. And they have the ability to access the rest that is in Christ Jesus just as much as, as you and I do. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a privilege. We are privileged to be able to step into something, hallelujah, to where we don't have to trust in the riches of this world. And we don't have to trust in horses nor chariots. We don't have to trust in who's in the White House. We don't have to rely, soto, we don't have to rely upon who's in Congress. Oh, my goodness. We don't have to rely on these things. We don't have to rely on local governments. We don't have to rely on who's running Montgomery County or Philadelphia County. We don't have to be scared or worried or fearful. Do we have our preferences? Sure. But we don't have to worry about it because God sets up rulers and he's the one that puts them down. I'm going to put my faith and my trust in the king of kings and the Lord above all lords and the governor of governors and the president of presidents uh, and the commander in chief above every commander in chief. He's Lord over Putin. He's Lord over Zelensky. He's Lord over Biden. He's uh, y'all not hearing me today. He is Lord over DeSantis. He's Lord over China. Woo! He's Lord. And every one of those knees are going to bow. Every one of those tongues are going to confess. Hallelujah. They're not going to have a choice. You today, you have access to the master of the universe. Today, you have access to the one that can stand upon the bow of the boat and say, peace, be still. He can speak to the storms and say, peace, be still. And they must be still. He can speak to the waters, hallelujah, with the fish that are in the sea. And he can tell folks, cast your net on the other side, hallelujah. And there will be fish that will feed your family for generations. He said, don't you... Don't you fret about what you're going to wear and what you're going to put on and what you're going to eat. Don't you fret about it because if he can feed the sparrows, he can feed you. And if he can clothe the lilies, he can clothe you. And ah, I'm telling you today, we serve a God with unlimited resources. Right. Unlimited. His powers unmatched. His greatness is unsearchable, David said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm trying to convince you and persuade you today to realize that there is no one and nothing greater than our God. So put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for your flesh. Don't let your flesh be in the driver's seat. Don't let what you think you know be in control. Hallelujah. Don't succumb to the ways and the customs and what, what Sally on your job is doing who ain't living for God hallelujah put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ put your faith in the only living God Amen. Matthew wrote in Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 he wrote fear not them who can destroy the body but rather fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell and if you don't got no reverence and fear for that entity, you are in dangerous waters. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're talking about the God who is able to breathe the breath of life. And he's also able in a moment's notice to snuff out that breath. In fact, he's so powerful, the scripture says, 
that no one took his life when he came in a body of flesh. <laughs> he freely gave it up. Hallelujah. So the devil can never say that he killed Jesus. Because nobody killed Jesus. He gave it up. I want to tell you this is your God. And if you're struggling to figure some things out in your personal life, I admonish you today, stop playing games, stop going in a hamster wheel, stop walking in and circling the wilderness, stop being stubborn, go find a place of prayer and talk to Jesus. Amen. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you. Hallelujah. Let me leave you with this last analogy I the Lord first gave me this probably about six years ago and every once in a while when I feel prompted to share this analogy I try to do it because it's very powerful and I want you to hear this very carefully I want you to imagine with me that you are trapped in a burning house you're trapped somewhere in one of the rooms and the house that you live in is physically burning down and the flames are all around you. You cannot get out. The carbon monoxide is getting ready to knock you slap out. You are choking, you are gasping. I know that's a terrible thing to imagine, but for, for the purposes of this illustration, just imagine that that is taking place. Luckily for you, the fire department is called and brave Firemen run into this burning house with all of their gear and their equipment and they fight through the flames to get to where you're at and they bring with them an, ox an oxygen mask for the purpose of putting it on you so that you can breathe as they safely lead you out to safety. Amen. When they reach you and they begin to Declare some commands with, with a hasty spirit. Come on, we got to go put this mask on. We're here to save you. And upon hearing those words, imagine if you would say, hold on. Hold on, Mr. Fireman. <coughs> I know I'm choking and dying right now. <coughs> I can't breathe. I'm about to pass out but I don't need this life-saving mask that you have brought me because yesterday I helped an old lady across the street. I know that sounds silly, but just go with me. Yesterday I found a hundred dollar bill and I saw the person who dropped it and I could have put it in my pocket and just went home, but I had integrity and I returned the hundred dollar bill just two days ago. Now you wouldn't have this much time to have this back and forth with the fireman, but just go with it. And so the fireman, upon hearing all of these wonderful good deeds and works that you've done yesterday, two days ago, last week, he says to you, yeah, that's great. But how is that going to save you now? That's not the antidote to get out of this fire. This mask is. And if you don't put on this mask, I don't care how many old ladies you helped across the street, you're gonna die. Now, every one of us, none of us would ever do that. We put on that mask and we get out of that house. But I'm just telling you, if somebody did that, that's the equivalent of looking at Jesus and saying, I don't need what you've got to help me. I helped an old lady across the street yesterday. That's our own works. We're trusting in our own ability. We're trusting in our haughtiness. We're trusting in our acumen. We're trusting in our position. We're, oh, y'all not hearing me today. We're, we're trusting in, in what we have developed and what we have accumulated. And, and Jesus is here to remind us today that Thank God that you're a good person, but being a good person will not deliver you from death. Whew. Being a 
good person will not deliver you from the flames. If you don't enter into the mask that I have provided, you're going to die in the fire. Hallelujah. I want, to, I want you to hear me today. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to minister to you from, 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 from a place of deep sincerity. And, I, and I'm ministering to myself as well. We have got to, to break out of the blindness or the blinders that often uh, uh, cause us uh, uh, to, to, to miss the mark, to, that often, that often uh, causes us uh, to, that we result in, in just doing our own thing and, and spinning on that hamster wheel and, and leaving Sunday church services, if you will, and going back to the same old patterns, the patterns that are leaving us empty and leaving us broken and weak and leaving us with shame in our hearts and shame in our mind and, and, and leaving us uh, so deeply tempted to go back to old ways and old addictions and stuff that we determined to put down on an, uh, 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 in an altar uh, uh, years ago, months ago, weeks ago. Hallelujah. We find ourselves constantly in that struggle and we feel empty and we feel like, I'm just, uh, what's the use? I will always be. I've come to tell you today, put on the mask that God's providing. Amen. Seek the face of God. Hallelujah. We've got to cease from our own works. Would you stand with me? I'm going to read this last passage. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, I'll start at verse 2. It says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers or different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration, that's akin to baptism. And the renewing of the Holy Ghost, that's being filled with God's Spirit over and over and over again. Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly. Make it your morning affirmations. It's by his mercy that I am breathing. It's by his mercy that I have awakened out of my sleep. I slept and then I awoke. Why? For he sustained me. Hallelujah. This is a faithful saying. That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Praise God. We don't do good to get God. We get God to get good. 